Vienna. He earned a doctorate at the University of Vienna in 1984, and he led the Austrian Fulbright Commission as executive director from a record length of time, 1997 to 2019. Uh, beyond his great accomplishments in leading educational exchange programs in Austria, he has published a number of historical works, including several editions of the book Central Europe, Enemies, Neighbors, and Friends, which I recommend to you as a very uh, useful survey. Johnson is currently working on a history of the global Fulbright program, uh, which he's calling tentatively Remembering Fulbright, the Remarkable History of the Fulbright Program, 1946, to uh, 2021. Uh, we begin there, uh, begin then with Magister Beitel. Uh, his paper title is Kreisky and the Media. Thank you for your um, introduction. Thank you so much. Yeah, should be working. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, a big thank you to all of you who made um, our conference possible today. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here today um, to talk about Geiske's visits to the United States and their media coverage, which will be explored in this presentation. In doing so, two things are linked, which had great importance of Geiske's political career. Geiske's masterful dealing with the media and his affinity for foreign affairs and state visits were important cornerstones on his success. I will focus on four selected visits during his time as chancellor. In this context, media coverage reveals not only much about the public perception of bilateral relations between the United States and Austria, but also between Kreisky and the respective US president. In my presentation today, I would also like to show that many supposedly non-political topics were reported on. For example, in the US media, Kreisky was mentioned much more frequently in the gossip column, while in the European newspapers, Kreisky was mentioned mainly in the politics section. Let me start with the first case study. In November 1974, Kreisky undertook an official state visit to the United States. The meeting with President Gerald Ford covered a number of subjects, including East-West relations and the Middle East. Furthermore, the economy, energy problems, and the question of Soviet Jews transiting through Austria were important topics. Kreisky's speech at the United Nations received wide attention and was taken up by the media. Nearly all newspapers and media stations which covered Kreisky's visit reported on Kreisky's talks with President Ford and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. New York Times also reported on the White House dinner and noted that the formal state dinner was bigger than affairs of that sort usually are. The Washington Post wrote, quote, Chancellor Kreisky stayed until after midnight, just long enough to chat with actor Rex Harrison and actress Julie Harris. President and Mrs. Ford waved Kreisky off into the windy night. Kreisky, his cabinet, the Austrian embassy and the Austrian information service in New York actively pursued opportunities for the chancellor to, open, um, to appear on major broadcasts. A visit to the television show speaking freely with NBC chief commentator Edwin Newman served as an example. Kreisky thus was among a list of participants that included Nobel Prize winner Heinrich Böll, NATO Secretary General Joseph Lanz, and Olaf Palme, the Prime Minister of Sweden. Based on Kreisky's interview, the Austrian Information Service expected two to three weeks of increased publicity for Austria in the media. The media, the American media coverage was also a topic in the Austrian media landscape. For example, the Austrian conservative national daily newspaper, Die Presse, noted that the American press 
had diminished the, the, claim, um, the glamour of the chancellor's visit by simply remaining silent. This view was countered by the head of the Austrian consulate general in New York in an internal letter. He said that this was not true and confirmed a strong coverage on television and radio. This was also confirmed by PR counsel Maurice Feldman. He noted that the New York Times published six articles about Kreisky, three of them in the notes on people's section, which you can see um, here. Additionally, Kreisky's nine minute interview on the most important morning news program, the Today Show, was seen by nearly 16 million people in the country. So let's turn our attention to the next visit in 1977. According to official documents and external communication, this trip to the United States by Kreisky was not an official visit in his function as chancellor. The purpose of this trip was to hand over the bicentennial gift. But however, this didn't mean that the visit had no political relevance. Several media focused on a potential metal and mining worker strike in Austria, which was prevented at the last minute. Kreisky underlined that if this strike couldn't have been prevented, he wouldn't have been able to make the trip. Kreisky commented, quote, you can do that in other countries, but not in Austria, unquote. The press department of the Austrian embassy tried to maximize the publicity value of the visit. Through the embassy's mediation, the foreign affairs editor of the Washington Post invited Kreisky to a breakfast. In addition, the embassy suggested to the New York Times an exclusive interview with Bruno Kreisky. This interview circulated worldwide. Kreisky's mode of travel was also a frequent topic of discussion, especially on his visits to the United States. As a result, during this trip, the focus was on his arrival in the Concorde. Scheduled flights from Paris to Washington began in May 1976. The social democratic newspaper Arbeiter Zeitung confirmed with this reference, agreeing on Kreisky's reputation as a modern and cosmopolitan politician. Kreisky raved about the advantages of the Concorde to the newspapers. The Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, ORF, perceived Kreisky's Concorde flight as an act of European solidarity, as the US Congress had just banned Concorde landings in the US. This visit also included a meeting with US President Jimmy Carter. Switzerland's Neue Zürcher Zeitung described Jimmy Carter's invitation to talk as a gesture of courtesy. Journalists critical of Kreisky accused him of having an obsession for a photo with President Carter. The criticism was that these photos were intended to replace a lack of success in domestic politics. Other media emphasized the special importance of this conversation during a non-official visit. Austria's best known tabloid, Die Kronenzeitung, celebrated the invitation as Kreisky's success. Numerous media around the world reported that Kreisky was only the fifth head of a government to be invited since President Carter became president seven weeks ago. Press reports, uh, press reports on the length of this conversation ranged from 10 minutes to half an hour. Governmental documents show that the planned five minute visit was extended to 30 minutes, which Austria's ambassador in Washington found remarkable. In subsequent interviews, Kreisky was obviously impressed by President Carter. From Washington, Kreisky went to Minneapolis, where he presented the bicentennial gift. Despite the diplomatic visits mentioned at the beginning, the focus on the reporting was on the actual purpose of the mission. Austria's bicentennial gift to the United States dominated the headlines. On ORF, 
Geisky once again explained the idea of the Austrian Study Center. Kreisky also presented the gift to members of the press as a token of appreciation and as a thank you to the US population. The Minneapolis Tribune quoted Kreisky, quote, a small country like Austria needs all the publicity it can get because there is always a danger that people far away from Austria will think we are Australia. <laughs> According to the Austrian embassy, Kreisky was delighted with the successful gift giving in Minneapolis and his visit to the state. Kreisky emphasized that he was now in no haste to make an official visit to the United States. So the next journey took Kreisky to Boston, Washington and New York. Kreisky's visit was classified as a private visit by American officials. However, this circumstance did not prevent him from undertaking a busy and state-supporting program. Kreisky met also President Carter. The conversation with Carter was arranged for 30 minutes and lasted one hour. For many Austrian journalists, the, dur the duration of the conversation was also a clear sign of, of a special interest of the American president. Kreisky also hosted a press event at the Overseas Writers Club. In Austria, Kreisky's visit was featured several days in a row and multiple times a day on all major OF news programs. Kreisky's speech in New York to the UN General Assembly was analyzed in detail. In addition to comments and opinions by Hugo Bortisch and other commentators, viewers were able to watch recordings of the UN speech. Kreisky's February 1983 visit to the United States was under different conditions than in previous years. Kreisky's visit was described at the time of clouded relations between the two countries. In 1983, Kreisky was already the longest ruling elected head of state in Western Europe. At the same time, according to Günther Bischoff and Elisabeth Röhrlich, Kreisky's era of his foreign policy and their changes were already more than evident in October 1981 within the context of the North-South Summit on cooperation and development in Cancun. For many political observers, the ideological contrasts between the old European socialist and America's symbolic conservative were an exciting political event. Talks between Kreisky and Reagan focused on the Middle East and Poland. Austrian and American officials discussed ways to prevent the potential flow of American technology through Austria to communist countries. The issue was a major bilateral and media concern before Kreisky's visit to the States and was backed up by strong criticisms against Austria. Afterwards, Kreisky and Reagan tried to allay concerns that the relations between the two countries were not that tense. As Wolfgang Petrich mentioned that Kreisky was enormously disappointed after this meeting, which was mainly due to Reagan's lack of knowledge of world politics. <laughs> the Austrian embassy observed that rather negative articles appeared before Kreisky's visit to Washington. As an example, Germany's newspapers reported very critically and sometimes rudely on Kreisky's visit. The Süddeutsche Zeitung was much more objective and saw the meeting as a diffusing of tensions which never existed. The French Le Mans saw Kreisky's visit as a step toward the American perspective. The weekly newspaper Business Week, which stands at the right of the conservative center, ran the headline, Can Reagan waltz Austria's Kreisky back to the center? This Business Week article suggested that Kreisky had left the political center. According to sources from the Austrian embassy, this article was probably influenced by political opposition circles in Austria, 
which the conservative politician from the Volkspartei, Andreas Kohl, didn't deny. Austrian newspapers that were less sympathetic, sympathetic to Kreisky readily picked up on the criticism in the American press. Nevertheless, the media coverage in advance of Kreisky's visit to the United States was tremendous. Austrian newspapers also highlighted Kreisky's fifth visit to America in 10 years. Besides the political content, Kreisky's age was now increasingly a topic in the media. The Austrian Kleine Zeitung ran the headline, quote, old men among themselves, unquote. The Washington Post reported very positively on Kreisky. Therein, the foreign policy of Kreisky was summarized. Reports in the New York Times have also been favorable. New York Times senior editor James Reston wrote several extended articles on Kreisky that were printed and distributed in several national and local newspapers. Reston wrote, quote, Kreisky is 72 years old, troubled by failing eyes and kidneys, but he is still a symbol of hope. He insists on negotiation, on talking across the Iron Curtain and other barriers, not only in Europe, but in the Middle East. Washington recognized that this old warrior had something to say, even if it didn't quite agree with his message. Despite some critical passages about Kreisky, Reston seemed very enthusiastic about Kreisky and his policies. Furthermore, an interview with Bruno Kreisky was broadcasted on NBC, on NBC's Today Show. The program, which lasted around six minutes, achieved an audience rating of 6.5 million viewers. Kreisky's last visit as chancellor brings me to the end of my presentation. To conclude, the insights into the media coverage reveal that this state visits to the United States were an important part of Kreisky's foreign policy. The bilateral contacts were perceived around the world and were a significant part of Kreisky's reputation as a respected foreign affairs politician. I hope that I was able to provide an interesting insight into this topic. Thank you for your attention and reception. Thank you, Sir Scott. Uh, a small footnote for the uh, comment from Kreisky about uh, making clear to Americans that Austria is not Australia. I learned soon after I became director of the center here that if I sent any mail to Austria, and wanted it to get there without going halfway around the world in the other direction, that I had to write Austria to Europe because the sorting mechanisms in the US Postal Service would otherwise send it first to Australia. Or well, Austria, Ohio. That's possible. <laughs> and uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to do the discussion at the panel. Michael Burry will follow now with a paper intriguingly titled The Sun King and the Intellectual, Bruno Kreisky, Heine Grimmel, and the United States. Uh, yeah, just yeah. so I'll take a second to also say uh, thank you very much to uh, the organizers, Howard Lokan. And Meyer, I remember when we first started talking about uh, this conference from the Botstieber Institute, Howard said, you know, um, sounds intriguing. You know, we're just getting back from COVID. Uh, you know, it's tough at Minnesota, but this is something we have to do. And the same thing Gunta said, you know, the second he heard it was going to be Kreisky workshop in the USA, he said, well, I would want to be part of that. And so I'm really glad this has finally come off. I also want to thank uh, Kevin McNamara, my colleague at uh, Bot Steber, who really makes things happen for us. Um, the Sun King, let me just make sure I got this one. Well, um, Sun King and the um, intellectual, Bruno Kreisky Heinrich Dimon in the United States, one age, two eras. Born a few months apart in January 11th, 
January 1911 and December 1912, respectively. The names Bruno Kreisky and Heinrich Drimmel today mark successive intervals in Austrian post-war history. The first, the Drimmel period, extends from 1954 to 1964, during which Drimmel served as a, a pay minister of education in five governments. The second, the Kreisky era, is anchored in the 1953 appointment of Bruno Kreisky as state secretary in the foreign ministry and defined by his three terms as FPA chancellor in 1970-1983. But these two names also represent successive chapters in a larger history of Second Republic Austria. And that story, the 1950s and, er and early 1960s, are darkened by the shadow of Drimmel, a figure deeply implicated in February 1934, a former Wehrmacht soldier and an education minister dismissive of the social sciences and hostile to modernization in Austrian universities. But as the 1960s unfold, the shadow lifts, dawn breaks. In 1970s, the freshly elected Chancellor Kreisky leads the country through a series of overdue domestic reforms while memorably defining a role for Austria internationally. The age of Drimmel, a homegrown devout Catholic, ends modern Austria is reborn under the leadership of the Jewish re-emigrate Kreisky. Many objections could be lodged against this story. And yet with respect to the relationship between Kreisky and the United States, placing Drimmel and Kreisky within a shared time frame is suggestive. In the first instance, it highlights a competition among elites to steer the post-1955 relationship between Austria and the United States. Indeed, indistinct boundaries concerning ministerial responsibilities during the period were grounded in the Austrian constitution itself, particularly in matters of foreign cultural diplomacy. Thus, starting in 1953, areas of shared competence for cultural policy abroad, including UNESCO, had been moved to a catch-all foreign department that was frequently renamed. But the shared time frame, and here we have Dremel as a kind of a foreign secretary and playing that role again. Uh, uh, but the shared time frame also recalls a tangled link between domestic affairs and Austrian foreign policy during these years. By the early 1950s, the young state secretary in the foreign ministry, Kreisky, already wrestled over foreign policy turf with the old, old Dremel, who in 1952 had risen to sections light and education ministry. Kreisky and Dremel were both past 30 when they encountered Americans for the first time. Drimmel later recalled this encounter at an American POW camp in uh, 1945. Hands up, he claimed, were the first words, English words, to ever reach his ears. And it was in another camp, near such camp near Naples, that Drimmel learned the English phrase, money makes it, a sentiment that would haunt his thinking about the United States in the decades ahead. In 1952, Drimmel made his first of many trips to the U.S. and later as education minister, uh, Later, as education minister, he would initiate the founding of the Austrian Cultural Institute in New York and decisively shape Austrian participation in Fulbright educational exchange, among other cultural diplomatic activities. In October 1957, a 36-year-old Bruno Kreisky attended the United Nations in his first visit to the United States, The Kreisky was already well known to American diplomats. Kreisky would subsequently burnish this reputation among the American public by means of his many appearances Across, and lectures across the U.S., a form of travel diplomacy that included speeches featured with civil rights leaders and appearances on national television. Early Second Republic years form one waypoint in a long relationship between Kreisky and Dremel. In the 1950s, they were colleagues, but they could also be rivals. While running for chancellor in 1970, Kreisky charged Dremel personally with borrowing him from university study in 1934, a charge Dremel angrily denied. Meanwhile, following his first exit from government in 1972, Drimmel described his return to writing books and articles as the continuation of politics by other means. For Drimmel, that politics had begun during his years as education minister, as I'd now like to show that politics took direct aim at a central premise of the Kreisky era. In his two books and many articles on America, Drimmel connected a particular image of Kreisky to American legacies and a post-war trends in Austria he opposed. His critique of Kreisky was a critique of the United States. Bruno Kreisky, the son came. As a matter of political practice, candidates for political public office often associate themselves with ideas, sentiments, and traditions they believe will endear themselves to, the, to their audience. In this way, they hope to merge positive values with their own political identity. The 1979 campaign image of a gesturing Bruno Kreisky positioned under uh, Emperor Franz Josef associated Kreisky with his Austrian roots. 
while playfully invoking the national Habsburg legacy. The politicians are often and more memorably the target of associations proposed by others. Perhaps the most enduring asso such association is Bruno Kreisky as Louis XIV, the Sun King. In fact, the power of this caricature is confirmed <laughs> by real efforts to refute it. Thus, the historian Friedrich Weissensteiner once demonstrated to readers of the Wiener Zeitung that the Kreisky Louis XIV parallel was false, citing among other such discrepancies the differences between Versailles and Ambustergasse. Mm -hmm. okay. What requires explanation is, of course, why the epithet Sun King stuck to Kreisky, or as a psychoanalyst might ask, what widely experienced anxieties does this verbal and visual joke release that accounts for its popularity, stain power, and wit? A literal response might see the connection between Austria and national reputation. The Sun King Louis XIV is peak France. Sun King Kreisky means Austria at the height of its significance. But I believe what's expressed here suggests both a, different, a greater degree of anxiety and a more specific attentiveness to Kreisky. In the popular imagination, Louis XIV is linked to the absolutist state, and it is this linkage that is reproduced in the Austrian image. To be sure, the contemporary Sun King Kreisky does not rule as a monarch. He is simply like Louis XIV, the spectacular merging of state and personality. The Sun King Kreisky stands for the idea of an Austrian state charged to carry out an unprecedented transformation of society and to become a permanent presence in everyday life. What, shapes this, what shape this state will finally take is not articulated in advance, nor are the limits to state expansion specified. The Austrian Sun King conveys these uncertainties and the unspoken anxieties that accompany them. Kreisky, l'état c'est moi. As Chancellor, Kreisky consistently sought a greater role for the state in domestic politics. What scholars would come to characterize as Austro-Keynesianism, a term that Kreisky liked, flourished during these years and his government practiced what Hans Seidel called an activist macroeconomic policy with a corresponding devaluation of the social partnership. It is moreover those phrases from the period that promise an increase in state intervention that today are essential to the Kreisky legend. For example, a few more billion shillings of debt causes me fewer sleepless nights and a few hundred thousand more jobless. For all that, however, Kreisky's most visible legacy may be the empowering of the state as an administrator of cultural policy. That policy vastly expanded cultural opportunities across Austria, but as Karl Markus Gauss rarely observed this convergence of state and culture, and now takes only an adjustment in the distribution of the available funds in response to economic trends to send whole areas of catch cultural activity into a spin. I'll skip the part that says that the, his visits to the US prefigured his uh, role as Sun King. Dremel, the intellectual. It speaks to the triumph of Kreisky today that little remains of the opposition that his expansion of the Austrian state once generated. That opposition, I want to be clear, was not energized by calls to privatize the economy, a la mer privat weniger Stadt, in the old phrase of Wolfgang Schussel. That neoliberal slogan called for increased state power in order to accelerate economic growth via privatization. What aroused the opposition of Dremel, by contrast, was precisely the fact that the state had appropriated authority to accelerate economic growth. Worse, this authority had now become a pretext for no limit expansion, with the result that the, with the, result that the can do, do all state had become a factory for the new human being. State policies and institutions created the citizens that the state itself required. Individuals who produced would become consumers. Economic production was organized to supply consumer goods. Through a slight of, a, slight of hand, the state cemented its own omnipotence. Moreover, it seemed that individuals could no longer imagine any alternative to this omnipotence, but here Dremel offered a solution. One had to separate one perspective from that of the state. To oppose the state, one had to become an intellectual. If Kreisky presented himself as a politician with intellectual credentials, Dremel presented himself as an intellectual with pol political credentials. For a long serving education minister, this self presentation contained a fair dose of irony. After all, the intellectual as this figure has emerged since the Enlightenment prizes cognitive autonomy and avoids commitments of any kind. Intellectual does not reproduce the relationship of the priest to the church, nor in the modern age, the intellectual is not bound to the state. Everywhere one looks, Dremel 
aimed to remain faithful to this latter ideal. Across his autobiographical Häuser meines Lebens, for example, Drimmel shapes his experiences. His experiences do not shape him. Names his education minister. He belongs to no party of his youth and family in Vienna. Drimmel speaks openly, but these have no lasting impact, impact upon him. Unlike Kreisky, who always placed 1934 at the center of his life story, the life of Drimmel, as he tells it, is without turning points. Drimmel once said that Kreisky was not an intellectual. I mean, he was an insult, okay? But it derived from his understanding of the cognitive intellect, uh, autonomy of the intellectual. As an intellectual, Drimmel positioned himself against the values of the rising post-war Austrian state. The manifesto for this position is his 1965 essay collection, Zehn Reden wieder den Geist. In those speeches, Drimmel attacked the state administration of culture, disputed the uh, correlation between prosperity and good social behavior by citing research that showed property crimes doubled in Austria after employment rose in the 1930s, and he excoriated the elevation of material ideals. On the surface, the state manifested many crises, but these crises shared the common source of economic liberalism, whose roots were Aust American rather than Austrian. This economic liberalism prioritized ex economic expansion and authorized the state to ensure an always booming economy. In this sense, the United States and Austria were the antipoden, as German had titled this history of the two countries prior to 1918. Even so, the American economic policy had become the tragedy of Austria. Taking stock of the Austrian Civil War, Drimmel found its primary cause in the 1929 stock market exchange. G. Drimmel observed that since the Vienna stock market crash of 1873, most of the large economic crises to date are the product of unrestrained expansionary pressure of economic liberalism. Conscious that political alliances discourage open expression and cultural exchange, Bruno Kreisky once wrote that our relationship should not prevent us Austrians from expressing our opinions as true friends of America. Freed from such alliances, it might be said Drimmel took his own intellectual economy and as an obligation to find fault with the United States. In particular, the essays he wrote for the Catholic Weekly, Die Furche, during the late 1960s and early, early 1970s shined a bright light on the shortcomings of the United States with its prison uprisings, school bombings inspired by racism, repression of indigenous peoples, and so forth. But these shortcomings, shortcomings also had a distinctly Austrian echo. In his May 1972 article, The Dictatorship of the Welfare State, the Swedish model, Drimmel endorsed the New Totalitarians, a recent book by British journalist Roland Huntford. Following Huntford, Drimmel warned that Sweden, a country that, quote, in its post-war progressiveness, had become more American than the United States, was perfecting new forms of state repression. He added that new Austrian politics was accelerating its efforts to mimic Swedish ideals, whose steep price was one of the highest suicide rates in the world. More American than the United States was one of Drimmel's favorite phrases. And when there was more American, Austria was often nearby. Of course, in 1972, the equation Sweden equals America is a transparent attack on Kreisky's past, together with his efforts to bring the Swedish economy to uh, um, economic model to Austria. Where its, where its focus is economic liberalism, Drimmel's critique does not map easily onto conventional East-West oppositions. Addressing one of this liberalism's harmful consequences, the rise of a fatherless and fatherlandless society, for example, Drimmel observed communists everywhere mocked the loss of the father in capitalism, and that the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese certainly had a fatherland. Drimmel generally presented the East as a foil to the West rather than as an ideal to be imitated, but in preserving an ideal Austria against new historiographies coming from the United States, uh, he could also resort to tropes familiar to Kreisky. Reviewing the Austrian mind by William Johnston in 1974, Drimmel bristled at Johnston's observation that Jews contributed disproportionately to intellectual life in old Austria. The issue here, he wrote, was not so much the implied inferiority of other Austrians, but whether Jews, and the Jews in question, were really Austrians at all. Kreisky knew about that. Such sentiments did not often find their way into Drimmel's professional histories. Still, it's largely the fallibility of the United States against an ideal Austria that occupies center stage in the Antipoden. 
Thus, Woodrow Wilson was worse than Franz Josef because whereas Franz Josef had only started a war, uh, Woodrow Wilson ended it badly. One of the many ironies of Dremel the intellectual is that his political roots were in the powerful Catholic Kartellverband, and he owed his appointment as Minister of Education to the Vienna Auxiliary Bishop, Franz Joachim. But in fact, his assault on the economic liberalism of uh, the state also owed much to Catholic elite discourse of the 1950s. Such an assault worked the traditional church objections to its incursions upon its authority by the state, sure doesn't like the state, but it also signaled a distancing of the church from Austrian, policy, Austrian party politics. And it offered proof that Catholic leaders had learned from the 1930s when the church had over-identified with the Christian social party. By separating itself from the economic focus of all major parties, the church might thus hope to regain religiously oriented socialist voters. Finally, the assault on economic liberalism provided a much needed alternative explanation for the rise of national socialism. Conservatives in Germany and Austria found little to like about histories of national socialism as a homegrown phenomenon, and their audience had grown tired of the old culprits Versailles and Saint-Germain. Conclusion. Bruno Kreisky recalled Dremel from his times in the 1950s as a wonderful interlocutor. Intolerant of rivals of any kind, Dremel would probably not have returned the compliment. Nevertheless, as a pair, Kreisky and Dremel represent the high point of the Austrian political intellectual in the Second Republic, a late manifestation in the tradition of Otto Bauer, Karl Renno, and others. Kreisky's wit could get a laugh from Henry Kissinger and his forum. Policy skills set a standard that would be feared by every future Austrian chancellor. Meanwhile, an open-minded reading of his two books on Aus American history and politics places Dremel as the preeminent American expert, preeminent Austrian expert on the United States of his time, not excluding Gerald Sturz. Whether Dremel was anti-American while Kreisky was pro-American, I'm not, I mean, I don't know that that matters much. Kreisky said that both the socialist president, Theodor Körner, and the conservative chancellor, Julius Rob, appeared at least unconsciously to have a certain aversion to Americans. This aversion could be traced to the First World War. I mean, Dremel's time in the POW camp probably did shape his view as American, of Americans, but his aggressive promotion of Austria to the US under his leadership in the uh, uh, education ministry suggests the politician Dremel needed no lessons in pragmatism. Moreover, reading that dr situates Dremel and his sharp critique of the US within a wider discourse of Austrian anti-Americanism misses how much he directly mobilized that critique in response to domestic Austrian politics. More importantly, it disregards one of the great insights to us left by Bruno Kreisky, the enduring image of the Sun King or the unease with the total state. In his self-styling and as an intellectual, Dremel remained in the public eye into the 1980s, an achievement in Austria where public careers often end with defeat at the ballot box. To be sure, his railings against the increasing role of the state in everyday life meant that he would never again shape policymaking. The foreign policy of, of Kreisky, namely the neutral Austria, could discover for itself a meaningful international role within the East-West conflict was closed to Dremel. The Minister of Education remained a Minister of Education. Dremel recoiled from the social trends that he believed the modern state promoted, including increased sexual freedom, gay lifestyles, hippie values, and more. In this rejection, it must be said that in, in 2023, Dremel's no longer with us. <laughs> Moreover, his embrace of the Austrian Ständerstadt and his post-war promotion of former National Socialists remains problematic. And yet, across Europe and the US, the perils of climate change have produced renewed calls for a degrowth agenda, reduced consumption, and an increasing questioning of state-led economic ambitions. As old party affiliation and uh, rallying cries continue to fade in Austria, who did what to whom in 1934 is rapidly becoming the snow of yesterday. History, it is said, is irony in motion. No one knows how the future will see us. The Dremel era may still be in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for observing the time of it. I'm doing very well on time. Uh, so let me invite uh, Lonnie uh, to the podium.
Uh, Lonnie will speak uh, on a subject of uh, uh, very important local interest. Austria's bicentennial gift to the United States in 1976, the Fulbright program, Bruno Kreisky, and the establishment of the Center for Austrian Studies at the University of Minnesota. Lonnie. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, I'd also like to thank everybody associated with this, uh, with this event. Uh, this is perhaps the only place and the only audience uh, that I can find for a topic uh, which I'm going to try to frame in somewhat uh, broader terms, otherwise it's a very curious footnote uh, in Kreisky's biography and in the history of the University of Minnesota. Uh, but I would like to frame that uh, in terms of my own experience and interests a little bit differently. Uh, what does it say about Austrian uh, public diplomacy? Uh, that is, public diplomacy defined as state attempts to inform, influence, or manipulate foreign audiences. Uh, the word public diplomacy uh, was invented in the United States uh, because we didn't like the idea of propaganda. So uh, this is what public diplomacy is. It's the American version of propaganda. Interestingly enough, the word public diplomacy is not used in German, uh, and it doesn't exist. I called uh, Emil Bricks up, and I said, what, what, what is uh, public diplomacy? He said, oh, we don't use that term. I said, what do you use? And he says, Auslandskulturpolitik. So this is foreign uh, uh, a cultural policy abroad. Uh, I'm also interested in the history of the Fulbright program. Uh, there weren't any meaningful points of contact between Fulbright, the politician, and Kreisky, which surprised me because they had so much in common as, uh, as internationalists. Uh, uh, Fulbright was an advocate of uh, a detente uh, before detente uh, was, uh, uh, was fashionable. Uh, he also was uh, very pro-Palestinian, but they uh, there's there's only one trivial letter in the Kreisky archive uh, on their on their relationship. So uh, there are a lot of disparate things that uh, come together here: the bicentennial gift, uh, uh, the Fulbright program, Kreisky, uh, the center for the idea of a center for Austrian studies, and uh, the University of Minnesota. Uh, so my my central uh, thesis is that Austrian Federal Chancellor Bruno Kreisky was instrumental in the decision to make the 1976 bicentennial gift from the people of Austria to the people of the United States in the form of a $1 million endowment to establish a Center for Austrian Studies, Lehrstuhl für Österreich Studien, at an American institution. And he also was instrumental in helping make the decision uh, to place it here at the University of Minnesota as one of uh, 15 uh, different uh, institutions. So I'm going to try to briefly ask and answer uh, three questions. Whose idea was it to have the Republic of Austria establish a Center for Austrian Studies uh, at an American university? Uh, this was the first one that was uh, uh, established. Uh, why was the bicentennial gift denominated at uh, $1 million? And how was this money raised in Austria as part of the bicentennial commemoration, and why Minnesota? Yeah. Uh, which political and institutional considerations played decisive roles in the Austrian government's decision to se select the University of Minnesota from among the 15 uh, competing institutions, many of them uh, uh, private and many of them uh, uh, bigger names? Uh, so we'll start briefly with the, uh, with the, with the bicentennial. Uh, oh, pardon me. I, this, is, this is the I have some good Fulbright pictures, yeah? Uh, this is the first Fulbright agreement establishing the Fulbright Commission, the US Educational Commission in 1950. Uh, Secretary of State, uh, 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 Dean Atchison. Here's Fulbright in the middle, handsome guy. And the plenipotentiary of uh, Ludwig Kleinwechter. There was no Austrian ambassador at that time because Austria was not a sovereign state. And uh, this is a, part of the inaugural a group of Fulbrighters going to the United States. They're in Genoa on their way uh, to their port of entry. Interesting in this picture is the, uh, is the large number of women that you see uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this initial group. And then here, uh, Kreisky as uh, foreign minister at the signature of the second Austrian-American agreement. Uh, here's Dremel. Uh, and here is Anton Korhansel 
uh, the legendary executive director of the of, of the of the Fulbright uh, of the Fulbright Commission. So the uh, American Bicentennial planning for the American Bicentennial already started in 1966. Uh, it was reorganized in 1973, and the federal legislation said that it was to provide for the observance and commemoration of the anniversary. Uh, and for those activities, state, local, national, and in, uh, international. It was a big deal. Yeah? Uh, there are some people who are old enough uh, to remember it, I think. Uh, 65,000 national events were documented and six, 650 international uh, commemorative events and projects. And uh, that, uh, uh, that didn't include uh, the Austrian uh, project because that did not come to, to fruition until uh, 1977. Uh, uh, and we're actually approaching the uh, uh, semi-quincentennial, 250 years. We'll see what type of celebration uh, that is going to be. Uh, the run-up to this bicentennial was tough. It was Watergate and the uh, evacuation of Saigon. Yeah. So there, I'm going to introduce you to two of the key players in this entire project. The first is Manfred Mautner Markov Jr. Uh, he was the president of the Austrian American Society, uh, which was an important post-war organization. It still exists today, but these uh, Vereine, these associations, simply don't have the audiences or the functions that they once once had. And each of the occupational uh, powers had their own uh, front organizations, and the Austrian American Society played that role for the United States. Also, was instrumental in distributing care packages immediately. Uh, after the end of the Second World War, there was the Federation, Federation France Autriche, British Council, uh, a Soviet, uh, a Soviet, uh, Austrian uh, Friendship Society, etc. Uh, he was a, a, a conservative, uh, a multifunctionary in the ÖVP, and uh, the Austrian American Society assumed responsibility for planning the bicentennial events in Austria. And they had their first meeting in 1973. And the purpose of this was to congratulate America and to express our solidarity and thanks, Verbundenheit und Dankbarkeit with the United States of America. The second and really most important individual here is Robin Winks, a prolific, prolific historian from uh, Yale University. He wrote about espionage. He wrote about blacks in Canada. He wrote about imperialism. He was a prolific, prolific scholar. He was a, a Fulbright alum. He was recruited by USIA to serve as a so-called super cultural affairs officer uh, in London at the peak of the uh, anti-Vietnam protests. Uh, he became the director of the Office for Special Projects and Foundations at Yale in 1974, served in that capacity as two years, and was also an advisor to the Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs for the Bicentennial. Okay? the chairman of the Bicentennial Committee for International Conferences of Americanists. And he filled that position for three years and this brought him into contact with Austria. He organized five international conferences uh, by world regions. The European conference was held uh, at the Salzburg Seminar in Leopoldskron. And then he published uh, a collection of essays called Other Voices, uh, Other Views, which is a very, very interesting look at the way American studies people saw the United States in the mid 70s. So he's the chairman of this, uh, of this committee and he promotes the idea of having countries establish programs of, uh, for the study of their respective histories and cultures in the United States as a bicentennial gift, okay? So the idea behind the Center of Austrian Studies uh, was propagated by an American Fulbrighter based on what the United States had done under the auspices of the Fulbright program after the Second World War. They were particularly interested in the promotion of America, the study of uh, American culture, not American studies, the study of American history and culture, and the promotion of social uh, sciences. So we basically have the foreign imitation of the U.S. promotion of American studies globally, yeah, under the auspices of the Information Service and the Fulbright program, Let's turn it around, okay? We're gonna have a reversal of roles here. And once Americans had given other nation gifts by which they might begin programs in American studies, now it was the other nations giving Americans gifts 
to persuade them to study them seriously, okay? And uh, uh, Austria wasn't the only example here. Uh, there was a Canadian uh, gift made to Yale and Canada was one of Wink's fields of specialization. That was his, uh, that was his baby. And there was also an Australian uh, gift that went to Harvard, in both cases, uh, visiting, visiting professors. So Wink's is in, uh, in Austria under the auspices of this bicentennial committee he visits ministries for higher education and for foreign affairs and advances uh, 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 advances the 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 idea of the center. It wasn't too clear what Winks really proposed after it got into the pipeline. Okay, so yeah, first of all, I said that Austrian studies are underexposed in German departments, and anybody sitting in the Ministry of of, of uh, Education was really glad to hear that. They knew that. So they were always concerned about the relationship of the study of Austria uh, to the study of Germany under the auspices of the study of German philology. It was always a big problem. So he said he proposed a chair for Austrian studies at a U.S. university, any U.S. university, as a bicentennial gift. And he said it would cost a million dollars if it were at Yale or at Harvard. That's how the million dollar, uh, the million dollar gift came. It, it could have been less elsewhere. But this is the this is the information then that got into the pipeline uh, or into the meat grinder. Uh, and he was acting as the chair of the bicentennial committee, not as a professor of Yale and not as an executive of Yale. Okay. Now that that doesn't make any difference. Okay. There's a lot of uh, a lot of ensuing confusion in the following 16, 18 months. Uh, the Austro-American Society promotes the idea, yeah, uh, but it was unclear which ministry was uh, was going to be responsible. If you're if you're if you're familiar with the way uh, bureaucratic territory works, none of the ministries, uh, all, all they all thought it was a good idea. None of them wanted to do it, and above all, nobody wanted to finance it. Yeah, <laughs> it was unclear what Winks had proposed. Yeah, uh, there were ideas to get public funds. The other is to get the big banks to pay. Or to get the social partners to pay, yeah, we'll get somebody to pay for it. So uh, by the by the end of 1975, the bicentennial year is coming up, and the Austrians still don't have any big project. Mautner Markov meets Kreisky, who was, who, was, who supported the idea, yeah, but it was an initiative of the Austrian American Society. Meets Kreisky and says, uh, "Yeah, we have this Austrian chair at Yale." So this had morphed into the Austrian chair at Yale. And it's the only really big contribution to the bicentennial that we're going to make in Austria. And he employs Kreisky to personally intervene uh, because his plan was to get the social partners and the Ministry of Science, five parties, $200,000 each, and they were going to finance the center. So the, the first problem was to sort out uh, what Winks actually said. It wasn't for Yale, okay? Uh, although Winks, uh, Winks was uh, definitely in, 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 the, in the running here. And it's at this meeting in December that Kreisky puts the whole project together, yeah? Okay, in light of the substantial help that Austria received from the U.S. in the post-war years to call on the people of Austria to contribute to the project, yeah? This is a people-to-people -people gift, yeah? He wanted to establish a national committee, more or less nonpartisan. If anything, it can be nonpartisan in Austria. This came pretty close. Personalities from public life, politics, the arts, et cetera. And he was going to have the Austrian government match the funds that this national committee raised, uh, solicited pro bono support from the media, and he got the uh, U.S. communications expert Eric Eric Dorn involved. Uh, Dorn masterminded uh, uh, eight uh, successful socialist election campaigns between 1969 and 1982. He was really very very sharp. Yeah, and they came up and they used the American bicentennial star as the symbol of for the Austrian National Committee, 200 years, USA. And this was called into, uh, this is a, uh, a national committee. It was not a governmental uh, body. And this is how it was organized. Uh, there was a board. And here you see we have uh, Kreisky as the chair, uh, five socialist ministers. Koren and uh, Mock initially weren't included in the national committee, but were added later, OK? So when it was initially constituted, they weren't on it, uh, but they were added in the next three months. Mautner Markov 
the direct the, the head of the uh, the president of the Austrian is is the is the vice uh, uh, vice chairman of the committee. Uh, then you have the distinguished uh, let's call them civilians and two managing directors. Uh, Schrems uh, is the secretary general of the Austrian American Society, so he's a conservative. Uh, the other one is Dorn. He's working for the SPU. So red, black, red, black. And then, uh, then, then you have the civilians here, Nussbaumer, Oberhammer, Portisch, myself probably. And then, most importantly, you had an expert advisory board. Uh, uh, Fierenberg was responsible for doing the conceptual work on the center. And this was done by, uh, by uh, Willi Schlag, Wilhelm Schlag, very, very important guy. Uh, Nussbaumer and Schrems. Uh, Nussbaumer had no uh, party affiliation. So you had uh, political bodies, and then you had uh, people who were responsible for programming and, 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 and academic uh, affairs. So in the America Stern, this is what this star was called, uh, was, was crowdfunding plus a lottery. This is how it was set up, a very, very modern approach. Doran got a US-based public relations agency involved, Walter Thompson. They drafted the whole campaign. They were going to sell the, bi uh, bi uh, the bicentennial America Stern, 50 shillings a shot. They were simultaneously lottery tickets. And uh, all of the prizes and everything was, was, was donated. It was amazing. Uh, uh, Kreisky turned to the media. They did all of the advertising. There were weekly drawings on national television. The target was to raise a half a million dollars, which the Austrian government would match. And this is then the promotion. This is the way it looked. You bought this. This was on the cover. That was on the inside. It explained that the purpose was to give Americans uh, a, a birthday, a present that will make history, okay? Uh, we're, going to, we're going to give them something so that they understand us even better. And Ronnie, there was a, uh, a decal, a claver. Yeah, the, the decal. This is the decal, okay? So you could you could take that off and uh, that was you you put it on your car window or anything else and then that's the that's the lottery that's the lottery ticket. Uh, Kreisky also uh, was responsible for saying we also can use this as an educational opportunity to explain to younger Austrians how important the United States was for us in the post-war period because they don't know they didn't experience that and he came up with a project called America in Via. So uh, he wanted to uh, see that he wanted uh, this to be an uh, intergenerational exercise in political education on the Austro-American uh, relationships. The Doran put together a 16-page brochure, which uh, uh, in the test run had too many pictures of Bruno Kreisky and not any pictures of the conservative uh, prominence. They, they did. They had to do a second run, uh, uh, and they they made those editorial changes. Uh, and this is, of course, what do you see? Yeah, four in a jeep. Uh, Marshall, the Marshall Plan, very, very prominent. American Field Service, all of the establishment of the Austria American Society, mm -hmm. Fulbright, on and on and on. It really runs uh, uh, really strong until the signing of the straight state treaty, and in the first, uh, the first version, the ultimate. A picture in here is of Kreisky as foreign minister uh, with Kennedy in 1961. Uh, uh, the fundraising surpassed all expectations. It was a great, it was really, really a great success. Uh, instead of uh, the target was for a million and they actually raised 1.45. Now the, 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 the big thinkers behind this uh, project then ended up being Kreisky and Wilhelm Schlag, this was taken when, when, when they were in Minnesota, because they had to define what Austrian studies was, and they had to, they had to pick a host institution uh, for the chair. And uh, Willi Schlag was uh, perhaps the most inf influential person in the articulation of this Auslandskulturpolitik and in the conceptualization of the Center for Austrian Studies. POW in Nebraska, uh, a Smith Munt grantee at the uh, uh, University of, of, of Southern of Southern California, like uh, 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 Ambassador Petrich, who was a Fulbright grantee in Southern California, uh, he came back, became the first Executive Secretary of the U.S. Educational Commission, the Fulbright Commission, is recruited by Drimmel then 
to go to the United States to become the director of the Austria Institute, which was an independent organization, but then brought into the foreign ministry uh, during during his uh, his tenure. He knew the United States very, very well, also taught on the adjunct faculty of Columbia at that time. Uh, then he comes back home and establishes the, the uh, Department for Bilateral Relations, goes to London, and then he establishes the Department for International Affairs at the Ministry of Science and Research. He understood how tough it was for Austria on the New York market, yeah? How am I going to get anybody interested in this little country with all of the competition in New York? So he really knew it was, a, it was about product placement. Yeah, he understood this. And but he is a section chef for Fürnberg. At, at the end of his career, he became, yeah, he, he yeah. became a section chef responsible for museums and libraries. Oh, that was his, crowning, yeah. that was his yeah. crowning achievement, but he really, he, he, he uh, he created both of these departments and he headed them both up. So he had a lot of uh, uh, bureaucratic clout. And his task was to draft the criteria for the award uh, for, uh, for Fjernberg. And he did so in, uh, in a six page memo and he posed three questions. What should be taught? What is Austrian studies? Uh, how should an institute or chair be organized? And uh, where should it be established? So anybody involved in uh, academic policy making and institutions knows uh, how complicated this kind of stuff can be. So what should be taught? Uh, he said, well, look, what do they teach in the United States? Area studies, that's what they teach. And Austria is subsumed under Central Europe or Eastern Europe, at least the Republic of Austria. And he has doubts that taking Austria out of its central European context would serve the purpose of such an institute or chair that is to pro uh, is the propagation of knowledge about Austria in the United States. He also constantly thought about the competition. He was concerned about German studies and he was concerned about Eastern European studies. Yeah, that's the competition. So he's really, he's, he's, he, he, he wants to place a, a Austrian studies center in an environment where it's not going to be overshadowed or where it can flourish. So uh, he says there are great interests for all aspects of history of Austria in the United States. Many of the American specialists are former Fulbrighters, uh, but he goes on to mention uh, the uh, United States Committee to promote the study of the history of the Habsburg monarchy and the uh, uh, the AHA group on Central European history and the Austrian history yearbook. This is all basically Habsburg studies, okay? <clears throat> but he says, Austrian studies broadly conceived needs to take all phases of Austrian political history into account, but also include economic, social, and cultural history with political science and geography mm -hmm. as ancillary disciplines. So broadly conceived, it has to be broadly conceived in order to better tap the in interest present in the United States. The bigger the topic of Austria studies is, the more interest that we will have. And he considered a long-term historically based multidisciplinary area studies approach more promising than what he called the somewhat vague and perhaps also inflated concept, Austrian studies, yeah? Etwas wagen und vielleicht auch, auch hochtrabenden Begriff. He said, he said what is Haas, you know? Uh, that was his reference if you were to limit Austrian studies uh, or, or, to, or try to define it uh, too, too narrowly, too, too narrowly. So how should it be organized? It has to be integrated into teaching and research. It has to be a permanent institution. It should be directed by an American expert. Uh, uh, it should be augmented by, uh, by guest visits and should peer, uh, publish a periodical if possible. He was very interested in the Austrian history yearbook and in the publication, Modern Austrian Literature. He knew how important it was to be in, in that uh, environment. Uh, where should it be established? He listed these institutions, uh, Yale, Robin Winks, of course, Stanford. He mentioned that they had a study abroad campus in Vienna. Uh, he does not list the University of Minnesota in this initial uh, list that, that he drew up. That was most of the memo was simply uh, describing uh, the, the various institutions and their profiles. So, this memory, mem memo gets sent out to the National Committee and Kreisky resets the agenda. 
Okay. He gets this and he says, he's not interested in another research center for Habsburg history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Schlag reformulates his, uh, his memorandum, taking the conceptions of the federal chancellor explicitly into account. Yeah. Austrian studies should focus above all on the various aspects of contemporary Austria. And then he lists as examples, among other things, yeah, neutrality, welfare state, social partnership, his, partnership, history since 1945, modern Austrian uh, literature, uh, logical positivism, uh, uh, modern Austrian music is. But uh, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is Kreisky's agenda. We want them to understand basically what we are doing or what I am doing, yeah? The expert advisory board gets to work. They review, uh, they narrow this down, they review eight applications of varying length, and they come up with a long list here, uh, and then a short list, uh, Yale, Minnesota, Stanford. Uh, uh, they have full, uh, full applications from, uh, from Yale and Minnesota. Stanford is lost uh, on, a, on a flight. Uh, there, were, there was no FedEx. There was no fax. Uh, they sent it by courier. It got lost. And they didn't follow up on it, and they didn't know it was lost. Okay, so it, it actually postponed the entire. There's a lot of serendipity here, yeah. But they agree on a formula for success: convergence of an appropriate university with an appropriate personality. That appropriate personality is Bill Wright, and uh, he's the founding father here. Uh, Don Davio is another Fulbrighter. He was the appropriate personality, too, in the field of Austrian literature. Michael Burry has written a very interesting article about the genealogy of the Austrian Studies Association. And uh, Gary Kleinfeld uh, was the uh, founder of the German Studies Association, ironically, a, um, a graduate of the Austrian program. This is Bill Wright. Uh, with his background, he was a Fulbrighter twice, once as a student and once as a scholar. He went on then to have a distinguished career in university uh, administration as an associate dean, and uh, he was responsible for the Office for International Programs, became associate to the vice president for academic affairs. Uh, Schlag and Nussbaumer visit Yale in Minnesota. They don't go to Stanford because they don't have any information. They concur that the Stanford proposal to have a floating chair does not provide for sufficient continuity or institutionalization. Minnesota had a better uh, had a, a a better structural proposal. Yeah, they meet, but then they can't uh, make a decision because they've decided to belatedly take the Stanford application into account. And this is where the political intervention begins. Walter. Uh, <laughs> Wendell Anderson makes every American, every Minnesotan's familiar with this wonderful cover of Time magazine. He intervenes. Hubert Humphrey, Senator, 49 to 64, Vice President, Senator again, 71 to 76. He intervenes. Uh, and he, he, he writes, of course, uh, that he hopes it's going to be, the center will be at Minnesota and I should like to express the hope that the center will be located at the University of Minnesota. It is a people's university, okay? Now, if that doesn't make a social Democrat's heart, <laughs> it's a people's university, yeah? Walter Mondale, yeah? Senator, uh, vice president-elect writes also as uh, uh, 12 days before the, before the campaign, also writes, uh, it's my alma mater, yeah? It's a land grant institution, yeah? For many of the children of our workers and farmers, the university has been the means by which higher education is made accessible to them, yeah? <laughs> this was true for me and for many other leaders of our state. For the children of our workers and farmers, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom. <laughs> what does the university do? They've got a plan. We imagine that the Austrian National Committee would want to establish a program not at a private university, but in a state-supported public university, as befits a gift from a people and state to another people and state. Okay, okay. Stanford, they've decided to to include Stanford. Stanford gets its senators in there. Yeah, they didn't write anything that nice. Yeah, so these are all alumni. They intervene too with Kreisky, but. Nothing, nothing's, nothing's going. 
<clears throat> then they also tried to pretend they're, they're an elite private institution and they, they want to compensate for that somehow. And they do so uh, by saying it's distinctively not the case that we're uh, uh, for wealthy and upper classes. So the, uh, the expert advisory board then does the final takes. Uh, Yale is disqualified for being on the East Coast because they wanted to, the, the, the logic then is, I said, well, we have, we have the information service, we have the cultural institute, we have the embassy. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna take any East Coast applications. And there was a very interesting application Gary, from, from Princeton as well. They, they dismissed that for geopolitical reasons, okay? And uh, let me move out. Uh, the, the reservation for Stanford's uh, proposal was a rotating chair of visiting Austrian scholars. They didn't like the rotating chair idea. And Stanford had its own firm ideas. Kreisky makes the Solomonic decision. We'll give the million to Minnesota and the rest to Stanford. The conservatives uh, want, express this, uh, a preference for Stanford. Kreisky, with a sort of uh, supportive expert opinion, uh, pushes Minnesota through uh, along uh, uh, in, in the course of the, of the final decision-making. He said, we will structurally achieve a maximum in Minnesota. Politically, it's also important to win over a man like Vice President Mondale as a friend of Austria. <laughs> so the democratic uh, connection here uh, played a very, very uh, important role. So there was a consensus with some dissenting opinion that Minnesota was the best proposal and the best place to put this. My last slides, okay. Structurally, the uh, University of Minnesota and Bill Wright meet the Austrian expert committee's expectations of a convergence of an appropriate university and an appropriate personality. Yeah. This was really uh, the, the best of all of the proposals. It's a public university, people's university, children, workers, farmers, politically, uh, 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 Mondale. Yeah. Here we have Kreisky's visit, Hubert Humphrey, Carter, uh, Carter Brzezinski, uh, Mondale. Then there was a very, very nice uh, write-up in the alumni news magazine. I can send that to you if you You're want to give me your email. Uh, very, power, very, power very power power. Power. okay. So, yeah, yeah. so for the people who, who didn't get it or who are just here, you give me your email address and, and I'll, uh, this is uh, nowadays what we would call cultural appropriation, okay? Yeah. Uh, this is a, a, a Dakota uh, peace pipe, and his close, Kreisky's closing re remarks were important. Uh, uh, he has admired the many American schemes which have enabled European students and professors to come to this country to study. Yeah. And he says, I believe that it's high time that we Europeans become better aware of the importance of international cultural relations and the fact that these are not a one-way street. I ask you to view our endeavors also from this point of view. Uh, it's a completely asymmetrical small state wanting to influence a large state in terms of public diplomacy. And then he circles back uh, to this actually, uh, this circles back actually to, 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 the, to, to the Wings idea. And my last slide of course, shows the impact of the Fulbright program on the center uh, uh, the, the, the founder, uh, Bill Wright, from 77 to 88. Uh, David Good served as six years. Uh, Gary Cohn served as, uh, as, a, as a decade. And then as interim director, that's uh, uh, Gerhard Weiss was an uh, interim director. Uh, so uh, what goes around comes around. This is sort of the full by karma. Uh, I would argue that there wouldn't be Austrian area studies in the United States without the Fulbright program. And the uh, Center for Austrian Studies uh, wouldn't exist without the Fulbright program either. Last but not least, Howard and I are what are called half brights. Uh, we were in a program that the Fulbright Commission manages for foreign language teaching assistance in Austrian secondary schools. So we're part of the Fulbright community too. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for going over. Thank you, Professor Bruce. Thank you for that stimulating talk. I should add, um, uh, when uh, Kreisky spoke uh, at here at the university, when he brought the million dollar check, uh, and Lonnie had just quoted from part of that uh, address, he also mentioned that, well, in our bringing in this endowment for uh, Center for Austrian Studies, we recognize very clearly this is a gift from ourselves to ourselves 
Uh, because you have now to do the work to create a center for Austrian studies. Yeah. So Kreisky, never less than candid uh, <laughs> about what his intentions were. So we do have some time for questions and discussion. And uh, I hope uh, there are, yeah, it's good there. Yeah, uh, thank you for three brilliant papers in this panel. Uh, we have Michael, Michael and, and Christopher. Come on, yeah, up, come on. Uh, all three, please. I'm sorry. Okay. So my question actually is uh, to Michael Gouri, because he sort of suggested uh, that Brimble was the resident expert on the United States in Austria in the 1970s. Now, if I looked at Brimble and I read the Antipoden very carefully, I think that's actually an anti-American screen. So. The idea that Trimble would be the top expert sort of totally uh, uh, shocks me. And I think we also should see this in light of today's situation where we still don't have an American history here in Austria. So that's why people like Trimble would assume such position. So can you maybe comment on the Antipoden a bit? Is that yeah. an anti American? I mean, that's my view. Yeah. I mean, I think. Uh, I want, would want to say the, that uh, he uses America in a certain way to to make arguments of, to, about regarding how he views Austria and what the future of Austria should be. But the Antipoden uh, has a very strong section on 18th century United States. He went through all the material on the American Revolution, very thorough on... And actually, the part on 1918 is the, is the shortest, and it's only up to 1918, which kind of tells you, you know, what his sort of his, his perspective is. He considers U.S. and Austria as uh, equal, you know, equals, which is interesting. And uh, he um, takes things like the U.S. Civil War very seriously. You know, he wrote the introduction to the Carl Sandburg. Uh, a biography of Abraham Lincoln in um, in Austria. He lectured in the U.S. with on the tours with Kreisky. Apparently, like Hans Kalberg says, you know that nobody wanted to you know speak after Kreisky or be on the same tour with him because he was so strong. But uh, Dremel came and spoke on 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 Sandburg. and so I think you know it's a a fair reading of uh, it's it's the book on Jimmy Carter to Stalin is much more. I mean, if you want to. You know, make this opposition is much more anti-American than the Antipoden, which is a pretty straightforward, straightforward history as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Daniel, so a question for Lonnie. So you were talking about the endowment and the million dollar, which it looks like it was very much publicized and it was a big thing. And I'm looking at it today. In the, when we're looking at foreign countries giving these kind of things, if you look at the German Stiftungs have millions of dollars or millions of euros spent in every country in the world to impact and show what their political party wants to do. And I know from colleagues in Germany that a lot of the time it's done bit where they don't want the public to know and how much money directly goes from the taxpayers to whatever good the reason is abroad. It's a lot of times gets criticism. So Austria in these years, in the 70s, could afford publicly $1 million to send for whatever is important. The folk would see that it's important to open in Minnesota a center for Austrian study. Would they not want it for more education in, in a region in Austria? Uh, uh, the, the, those were donations made by the Austrian people for a specific purpose. Yeah, and it was they were matched. Uh, uh, and uh, indeed, the, the problem that all of the Austrian centers have, a million's nice, the interest on that is very, very good. Uh, but when you have inflation and operating costs, you need to uh, continue to uh, seek support from the Republic of Austria, uh, which which has been forthcoming, but which uh, which could be higher as well. Uh, the Federal Republic of, of Germany puts a lot more money uh, into Auslandskulturpolitik uh, than uh, than the uh, than the uh, uh, Republic of Austria. Uh, the budget of the uh, German Academic Exchange Service is larger than the entire State Department budget uh, for uh, uh, for exchanges. So uh, it's it's a different kind of investment. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, Lonnie, was there nothing in the sources you saw uh, from any of the Austrians involved in planning uh, uh, this competition and the gift uh, that, well, you know, it's time and it's overdue that Austria do something and thanks for the Fulbright assistance, or not the Fulbright, the, the Marshall Plan assistance. Uh, look what the Germans have done with the German Marshall Fund. Yeah, well, well, that was that. But this this idea of saying thank you for uh, uh, and and the, the the speeches of Kreisky, his his official speech uh, uh, on the on the fifth of July was under the auspices of the summer school of the Austro-American Society in Salzburg. It wasn't a Staatsakt. It wasn't an active state. And but he pointed out that those are the two things. He was he appreciated the Marshall Plan Fund. And he also appreciated the Truman Doctrine. So it was this, uh, this sort of classic uh, uh, social democratic anti-communism plus the uh, appreciation. But the idea of catching up with West, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany didn't come up. Uh, competing, I think, for the Republic of Austria, competing with the Federal Republic of Germany has always been difficult. <clears throat> okay, because Bill Wright led me to believe in one conversation that that was also on the mind of somebody in Vienna. But maybe I'm mis uh, misremembering that. Uh, Oliver. Thank you so much for these three excellent presentations. Maybe a brief comment to the really eye opener by Lani, yeah, because I only knew some fragment parts uh, of the, the stories. Uh, I think the reason why it was publicized, yeah, had something to do with the self confidence yeah, of the 1970s. Yeah, Austria now is able to give something, yeah, and it's also part of. Uh, the play of active neutrality policy. Mm -hmm. uh, we are something, yeah? And this certainly also is an anti-thesis uh, to Germany, yeah? And you see it in the internal papers, what you refer to, yeah? And in this sense, I think uh, uh, Kreisky also played with this. Uh, a brief, uh, very hot question to Michael Burrow. I, uh, I appreciate your presentation and also bringing Heinrich Trimmel back um, uh, to the surface, but, uh, for me, he is still a, a strange character, and you elaborated uh, on this. Yeah, he was sent uh, uh, to the German army by the Nazis, and then reintegrated really big Nazi shots uh, into the uh, Viennese university life, like Kindermann and many others, and yeah. pushed also uh, an open anti-Semitism. My question to you, do you think that Brimmer uh, also, when... Uh, Analyzing the U.S. was an anti-Semitic, yeah, a very clear-cut uh, question to you. Yeah, I'm I'm not too sure. Yeah, that's uh, something which, uh, when for example, his uh, co controversy with Hans Kelsen and the Austrian Constitution also for me has an un anti semitic subtext. And also what you cited, I liked the the review yeah, on mm -hmm. Einstein's. Uh, Studies and Johnson's book. Yeah, that we would uh, appreciate that. And also, Christoph uh, Bagley, brief question. I think, uh, if I remember correctly, I somewhere uh, read in your charts the main the name of Maurice Feldman. Yeah, one of the yeah. PR agents of uh, Kreisky. Very strange figure, by the way. Yeah, got a lot of money from the Austrian taxpayers, and I'm not so sure about that. Uh, but have you found more references? on how these very effective Kreisky media policy was staged and, and who was the driving force uh, behind, uh, for example, the TV shows and other things? Was it the classical diplomatic service or agents uh, like Boris Stafford? Yeah, it depends, because in Austria, it was a very important person was Erich Dorn, mm -hmm. which you already yeah. mentioned. So, um, Kreisky was influenced by Erich Dorn and by the news he got from Erich Dorn. And in, in, in the United States, um, I think Maurice Feldman was in, in, the, in the Kreisky archive, one of the most important persons. And I couldn't find other persons which are reporting, um, yeah, more often or, or regularly. So I don't. Yeah, I would say that yeah. Maurice Feldman yeah. was one of the most important yeah. persons. And yes, of course, um, people from the embassy, from the diplomat corps. Um, we had a, a very good uh, honorary consul in New York, uh, John Leslie, Leslie uh, Austrian origin. Mm -hmm. 
And he actually had a lot of bringing Kreisky together with investment bankers. That's a bit mm -hmm. different from there. But it also illustrates how Kreisky very much focused on what is the relevance in uh, what are the main points in any culture, in American culture, of course, is the media, is the public, and money or investment. So, yeah. so here you could see how someone who um, has not really learned this in Austria, but has, uh, as an outward looking person, you realize this is, I have to deal with the uh, the, the tools that are there and with the, uh, and with the, uh, the focus uh, I have to put on these issues that the Americans consider important, which is not always the case that yeah. we know when we look in other, well, in other whatever, PR campaigns or so the other things, they often think they need to come up with, I don't know, Mozart and, and, and all this stuff. Yes, they, this is one part, but then for Kreisky, it was this kind of overarching idea of modernity. Yeah? And this was, of course, very much connected with the United States. Right? Yeah. So, I'll, I'll just give a quick, uh, yeah. I'll give a quick quick, uh, quick response to that. I mean, there's three uh, criticisms, uh, anti-American positions from Austria. The SPO, America's too capitalist. Uh, if I pay, there's no culture. FPO, they're too Jewish. Yeah. And I would say that this is like one of the unusual aspects of, of Drimmel as he probably a little more with SPO, too capitalist. Mm -hmm. And just to add, just one more thing with that, you know, Stephen Beller talks about why fantasy uh, wasn't accepted in Vienna right away, and because it was too Jewish. Yeah. And I think that this is sort of Kreisky's defending this old Austria against this the, this coming from the United States that it's really you know Jewish influence that's that makes you know Austria Vienna so you know distinctive. And so he's like in that older older generation. And so I, I whether or not he you know anti-Semitic aspect. Of, Probably some, but a, you know, traditional Austrian, not not you know, uh, making it his rallying flag. This emphasis also on modern Austria was important for Kreisky, but he dovetailed in a very interesting way with Willy Schlag, who uh, I think is completely underexposed in his importance as a, a thinker about Ausland's Kulturpolitik, uh, because Schlag said, "Look, if we're going to explain Austria, let's go back to the turn of the century." Yeah, and then let's identify the influence of Austrian modernity in global terms. Yeah, and that's that's and and we can relate that easily to contemporary Austria. So uh, Willy Schlag was very very clever in terms of uh, saying how are we going to position the Austrian story without recourse to the big imperial history all of the time, which was the which was part of the problem too, where the prevailing cliches, they talk about the five M's, uh, Maria Theresia, Mozart, mountains, music, and uh, Metternich, right? Uh, that that was the... Uh, right, but Schlag is, is understandable in the era of Kreisky and Fernberg. He is unimaginable in the era of Drimmel. Yeah. Uh, Drimmel hired Schlag. Well, but that's mature Schlag's position. <sighs> He, he articulated, well, Drimmel was already gone when he articulated that yeah. vision. Uh, he wrote a policy paper in the early 70s on, on how to sell Austria overseas. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, uh, please, Christoph, you need to get in. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, may I add a comment to your question, Daniel? Um, so it's very interesting because in the media, I found several um, arguments against Kreisky and against this um, bicentennial gift. Um, Especially what you mentioned that yeah we could use this money for domestic politics or we could use this money for our schools. So there were several arguments in the media, especially from conservative newspapers, which used this bicentennial gift as a uh, maybe not let's call it a campaign, but it's it seems useful to their um, targets to um, yeah vote against Kreisky. Yeah, there were some snotty remarks. Yeah. But we're giving the Americans what they told us they wanted. Yeah. Uh, Howard, you had that. No, it's just a, a brief observation. And I think Lonnie was beginning to go in this direction too. Um, I mean, it was a fascinating story. And now I finally feel like I've gotten the full history of how the Center for Austrian Studies 
um, comes here to, to Minnesota. But the, the question that you're um, uh, dealing with of what is Austrian studies and how do we place this intellectually in a North American Institute and this, this tension between Schlag, who wants to put this in a broader context of Central European, and then Kreisky comes in, no, it's got much be, it must be more Second Republic, is, is really an interesting one. And I can see really how Bill Wright fits the Kreisky model quite nicely. It's interesting, though, that over time, there's a number of factors in play here that I think it's Schlag's model that's really kind of that at least this is how I think the center works today in a broader, broader Central European context. The interesting thing, I'm from Minnesota, is Minnesota nice pays off. The University of Minnesota was the only people who asked the Austrians what they wanted. Yeah. Yale didn't do that. And Stanford told them what they were going to do. Yeah. yeah. So they asked them what they wanted. And Schlag uh, and uh, Mustafa, they coached Bill Wright when they came and visited. That's perfectly clear because at the end of the day, uh, Bill Wright, after the, the the gift was made, wrote and he explicitly thanked Willie and Nussbaumer uh, for the good advice that they had received. Yeah. So I think that's important. Did Schlag already know Wright before that visit? Of, of course, Bill Wright was a student when Willie uh, when Willie Schlag was the inaugural executive yeah. director yeah, yeah, yeah. There was of the. Uh, so they well. they knew each other. They knew each other personally, and Willie kept track of all of these. He knew yeah. all of these alumni. Yeah. Uh, let me throw in, particularly for the people in the audience uh, who are not specialists on the history of Austrian higher education and research, um, there's important work that uh, someone who's worked with who was here as a, uh, a doctoral fellow funded by the Austrian Science Ministry, uh, Thomas Kearney, mm -hmm. who's also worked with Lonnie. Uh, about uh, appointments, professorial appointments and habilitations uh, in the Vienna University through the 1950s. Uh, that and other researches show how little renovation and renewal there was of the Vienna University and Austrian university education in general through the 1950s. The great majority of the professors were survivors of the Ständestadt and the Nazi era through the 50s, and you don't get uh, a freshening up really until the 60s and 70s. Similarly, you don't have uh, science and research elevated to the level of major sections or a ministry, so to speak, until the Kreisky era when Hertha Fernberg is appointed. Uh, another sign of the times, and I was gonna ask Michael about this um, if we had time, uh, was um, there's an effort to revivify, revivify the social sciences after the Nazi period. Paul Lotzerstein comes back from American exile, uh, uh, having fled, he and Mari Yahuda and Zeichel, the, the authors of this uh, famous uh, study of the, uh, the uh, unemployed people of uh, Marian uh, and and, and Lotzerstein sees how impoverished the social sciences are in Austria. And he starts an institute for advanced study to train sociologists, political scientists uh, uh, that still exists. Uh, I don't think he, would, he succeeded to the extent that he wanted, but at least in the initial cohorts, some important people worked, had their intellectual formation and careers advanced. Peter Gerlich was one of them, Anton Perinka. Uh, but I'm wondering, did Drimmel, have any uh, voice, any attitude, any any uh, tour for, for or against Lazarsfeld and that initiative or anything in the social sciences other than generally, generally being hostile? Uh, and remember, Lazarsfeld was Jewish and a socialist, social democrat before that. I, I mean, he, he was anti-positivist, which meant that uh, anti-sociology of Lazarsfeld and did everything he could to to block the Institute for Advanced Study. Christian Fleck also writes about this, and it's a very interesting chapter, but... Uh, but... All right, we must not forget how important the Austrian federal government was, at least until almost 2000, in deciding who was or was not appointed a professor sure. in yeah. any Austrian university. Sure. A search committee would produce a short list of three 
and this goes all the way back to the late imperial period, and the short list of three would go to the ministry, and a sexy old chef or the minister or several would decide who of the of the dry forschlag would be offered the position. Uh, and so Dremel was in a position for 10 years to block the appointment of people that didn't fit his model. All of them. Yeah. Right. I think this is a, a very important point uh, you, you have been making. There's, by the way, another personality which is important uh, uh, to include in the pre Dremel era. This is uh, the section chef Otto Skrupensky. Yeah? Skrupensky is the one who fired uh, Kreisky from the university. Then during the Nazi period, disappeared. We don't know nothing about him, like Trimmel, what he did. Yeah, he was not in the army, but we don't know. And then came back in 45, yeah, and brought back, yeah, and was responsible uh, in the procedure you have uh, decided in the small remark uh, to our uh, university history in Vienna and the Institute of Contemporary History. Our faculty in the mid 1960s was against establishing an institute and against uh, nominating uh, Ludwig Gettich uh, uh, as a full professor. And it was then the Chancellor Klaus yeah, who just uh, uh, waved it through. Uh, this is university policy. Something, and uh, maybe I, I replace my question is what I still don't understand. Yeah? Uh, those people in 38, like Skrupensky and Trimble, yeah, they lost power. Yeah? And nevertheless, after 45, yeah, they brought back yeah, all these highly ideologized, right-wing, sometimes Catholic, former national socialists to the university. I still can't get it. Yeah? What's, what's the frame? Yeah? Why? Yeah? Is, is there an ideological overview i don't know yeah i don't okay do you have any thoughts i'll and, push it back yeah for me still it's a, a miracle i think it has something to do with uh, uh in my opinion and if you elaborated in, in your talk yeah with some uh, ideological layovers. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, there you find much closer affiliations and, and corporations yeah? on a content level, on ideological level, uh, between uh, former Christian socials yeah? and national so socialists. And we uh, uh, believe in, for example, Karas Borodajkiewicz yeah? is uh, one of these uh, rich builders. Yeah? He is a Nazi and at the same time a Roman Catholic. Yeah? Therefore, I think we, we must okay. dig a little bit deeper into these strange corporations, yeah, to understand this massive reintegration and at the same time this brutal fight against yeah. everything which has to do with modernity. All right, but is it possible to argue that the Social Democrats in the 50s are not blameless because, and I would speculate, Part of this is the historic neglect of higher education and the history right. of Austrian yeah. education yeah. Yeah. by the Social Democrats. Right. The Social Democrats were interested in elementary education, yeah. right. secondary to a limited extent, more vocational yeah. education, but the universities mm -hmm. were, had historically not been a concern uh, uh, of the Social Democrats, had always been a concern, or had certainly since the Kultur uh, the, the the cultural warfare of around 1900 had been a concern of the Christian yeah. socials, uh, and there's that continuity. So that a Dremel, that Skrebensky and Dremel come out of a long tradition yeah. in in the conservative Catholic camp uh, uh, of wanting higher ed to express their values yeah. and have their people. Yeah. I'll just say one quick thing about that. And, I mean, uh, Dremel was such a personality, you know, and Wolfgang Schussel said, Dremel, seeing Dremel was why he entered politics. He said it was too conservative, but that's why, you know, he made an impression on everybody he saw. And he was an alpha male. No, no, I mean, if there's such a thing. And, and you know, he never got over 1934. So, you know, when he was back in power, he was like, he still wanted to crush the, the socialists. And, you know, if, if it meant, you know, bringing back a few extra Nazis and making, you know, the socialists cry a little bit more, that was okay, too. I, you know, I think that that's a dimension of it. 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.